Hey guys, Ms. Peterson here, and welcome to our chemistry lecture on ionic compounds. In this lecture, we're going to be reviewing how ions form and then using those ions to create our ionic compound formula units. We'll also talk about the properties of ionic compounds and what we call them, how we name them. So, quick review. Electronegativity is going to be important in this unit, and that's the ability of an atom to attract electrons when bonding. Now, this is going to be low for metals on the left side of the periodic table and high for nonmetals on the right side of that table. We will also review ion formation. Okay? Metals, the ones in groups 1 through 3, um, 3 being 13 without aluminum, will lose all of their valence electrons, dropping down an energy level to form positive cations. And nonmetals, those elements in groups 15 to 17, will gain electrons until they have, four, until they have 8, forming negative anions. So let's review that real quick. Calcium. How many valence electrons does calcium have? Two. Okay. It has two valence electrons because it's in group two. So if we drew its dot diagram, it would be like this, and it would lose those two, oops, and become a Ca2 plus cation. Okay. What about potassium? Okay. It's got one valence electron. It will lose that one and become a K-positive ion. What about chlorine? Which group is chlorine in? Chlorine is in group 17, so it has seven valence electrons, meaning it needs to gain one and become a Cl-minus ion. Yep. And what about oxygen? Oxygen is in group 16 on the periodic table. It's got six valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. So to fill it up, it needs two more. So it will gain two electrons and become an O2 minus. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So why are we reviewing that? Well, we need to understand how ionic compounds form. And I highly encourage you guys to check out this video um, that walks you through the step-by-step -step process. And then this is basically what's going on. Sodium atom with its 12 protons. Oh, nope, sorry, 11 protons. Sodium's number 11 on the periodic table. 11 protons and 11 electrons has that one valence electron in its outermost shell, okay? Chlorine has 17 protons and 17 electrons, and it has seven valence electrons in its outermost shell. So when it forms an ionic compound, the valence electron from sodium will get transferred to the chlorine atom, okay? Forming those ions. Now, this connects back to that idea of electronegativity. Why does this happen? Okay. Well, chlorine, right next to fluorine on that periodic table, is a really attractive element. Okay. Chlorine is good at attracting electrons. Sodium, not so much. Sodium has a low ionization energy, meaning it's easy to steal their electrons, and a low electronegativity, meaning it's bad at attracting electrons. So, it makes sense that if these two are in an area together, chlorine has the ability to steal that electron. Okay. And I really liked this image that I had uh, picked up for this model of ionic compounds. But let's do a little skill practice right here because it's not perfect. What is misrepresented or poorly represented in this model over here? Okay. Well, does chlorine lose or gain electrons? when it forms an ion. Well, it's, it's gaining, okay? Nothing's happening to these electrons, and yet for some reason, they're not in this final picture. So let's go ahead and improve this model by adding in those electrons to chlorine so that all of its electrons are represented there. Okay, and then you can see that once they are ions, they both have that full outer shell of valence electrons. Therefore, they are stable. Okay, cool. Let's see how this looks. Okay, how we determine an ionic formula is basically we're looking for the single like particle 
of an ionic compound. And we form that by balancing the charges of the ions that make it up, okay? So whenever we have one of these problems, we're gonna identify the cation, that's gonna be the metal, the positive one, and the anion, that's gonna be the sad onion anion, okay, the negative one. We're gonna determine those charges on the ions and then balance the number of ions so that the amount of positive charge, the number of electrons lost, equals the amount of negative charge, the number of electrons gained. Okay, positive charge equals negative charge. You can also think of that as numbers of electrons lost equals the number of electrons gained. Okay, so let's see that in action and look at some examples. We got magnesium and chlorine. Now, magnesium is going to be our metal. Magnesium has two valence electrons. Okay, now chlorine is our non-metal, okay? Chlorine has seven valence electrons, okay? So, magnesium wants to lose ele two electrons, chlorine wants to gain one. So, what you're gonna see happen is magnesium's gonna give this one to chlorine, okay? And create that Cl minus ion. And then, if there's one chlorine atom around, we know there's another chlorine atom around. So to make the number of electrons lost equal the number of electrons gained, we add another chlorine atom, which can take that other electron and form another Cl minus. And when those two form the two Cl minuses, Mg has lost two electrons and it's an Mg2 plus, okay? So we have two electrons lost AKA a two positive charge, and then one two electrons gain, or a two negative charge. Therefore, we need one magnesium to two chlorine atoms. And how that's represented in the chemical formula, we would write it as MgCl2, okay? Let's look at another example. Calcium and nitrogen. Now these ones are going to be the hardest ones to balance, okay? Because we have calcium that wants to lose two electrons and form that Ca2 plus ion. And then we have our nitrogen, okay? Which has five valence electrons. It wants to gain three and form an N3 minus ion. Okay, now we need a way to make these be equal. The amount of positive charge from the calcium, the two electrons lost, two electrons, charge of plus two, equal the nitrogen that wants to form that three negative by gaining three electrons. We're basically looking for the least common um, multiple in this, okay? The greatest common factor or least common factor, I don't know. But let's go ahead and see how this works out, okay? This calcium can transfer two electrons to the nitrogen, okay? But the nitrogen still isn't happy, okay? It needs more electrons to get that full stable eight. So it can get those from a another calcium ion, okay? That will transfer this electron over there. So now that nitrogen is happy and has formed that N3 minus ion. This calcium's happy and formed that Ca2 plus ion but this calcium still has one electron to donate. So we're gonna go ahead and add in a, another nitrogen atom. Oh, with its five valence electrons that can take one more here. And now that calcium has lost two electrons and is the Ca2 plus, okay? But this nitrogen's still not happy yet. It needs two more electrons. So we're gonna need one more calcium that can donate its two electrons to fill in the rest of this nitrogen atom, forming that N3 minus, okay? So if we're looking at this, Okay, now it's all balanced. We have six electrons lost from the calcium atoms equals the six electrons gained by those two nitrogen ions, okay? AKA, we have a total charge 
of plus six from three calciums and a total charge of minus six from two nitrogens, making the formula of calcium nitride Ca3N2. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So what would we call that? How do we name them? Well, it's pretty easy for most of them. It's the cation and the anion prefix plus IDE. So sodium chloride means a sodium ion, which is Na+, bonded to a chlorine ion, which is Cl-. So that would just be NaCl. Magnesium phosphide means a magnesium ion bonded to a phosphorus ion, which is P3-. So if we have a 2 plus and a 3 minus, that formula will end up being Mg3P2. And if we have calcium bonded to fluorine, we would call it calcium fluoride. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Now, this can be a little bit more complicated for polyatomics. So we have a table of our polyatomic ions, okay? And if we're using any of those to form compounds, we just use their name. So lithium is Li+. Plus. Hydroxide is the polyatomic OH-. minus. So the formula is LiOH. Na is sodium. So, oop, that three should be down there. CO3 is the polyatomic ion called carbonate. Okay. And then ammonium is the polyatomic ion NH4+. Plus. Chloride is just a chlorine ion, so Cl minus. So ammonium chloride would be NH4Cl. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. One last thing on naming is, oops, erase that so you can see it, is that you know how those metal transition metals, uh, the D block of elements, we don't know how many valence electrons they have just by looking at the periodic table, okay? So for those, they can form multiple ions. And if they are able to do that, we denote what their charge is by using Roman numerals. So for example, we can have iron 2 chloride, which is iron with a charge of 2 positive bonded to the Cl minus. So its formula would be FeCl2. Or we could have iron 3 chloride, which is talking about iron with a charge of 3 positive bonded to that 1 minus. So to balance out those charges, It'll be FeCl3. Now, in this, you might have noticed a little trick, okay? One of the shortcuts for figuring out the ionic formula is to take the charges and flip them. So this charge of three on the iron becomes the subscript, the number of ions of chlorine. This charge of one on the chlorine becomes the number of atoms of iron, okay? So that is a shortcut you can use. Two goes there, one goes there. Okay, chemistry, our ones are invisible. Okay, cool. So what about their properties? Well, when ionic compounds form, okay, they don't exist as just little solid one chlorine bonded to one sodium. Rather, they exist in these big, giant, crystal lattice structures where every single positive ion is attracted to all the negative ions around it, and negative ions are attracted to all the positive ions around it. So there's tons of forces here, okay? It's a super strong bond held together by electrostatic attraction, that Coulomb's law opposites attract. Okay? So because of this, Okay? It's going to be really hard. There's a lot of forces here. In order to break this in half, you have to break all of those forces. Okay? It's going to have a high melting point. It's going to be hard to get these to separate and move around. Okay? And sodium chloride, table salt, is the classic example of an ionic compound. Um, and it can, can you boil that or melt it on your stove? No. Sugar is a covalent compound, which we'll get to next. Those you can melt on your stove and make caramel or rock sugar or anything like that. But salt, not so much. And then in order to conduct electricity, you have to have charges that are free to move. As a solid, we do not have charges that are free to move. But if we put this solid in water, what happens is each of the individual ions end up breaking apart. 
And so then you'll have individual ions floating around in the water, which can carry charge. Okay, cool. That's it for ionic compounds. Okay, cool.